Hello, I'm Dale Doherty, and I'm here with Anil Dash. Hello. Who's a very thoughtful writer and um, thinker about a lot of things, but mm -hmm. uh, I ran into you last year. You were sitting kind of under the rockets in, in yeah. the Hall of Science, yeah. and I was, I was delighted to see you there. Mm -hmm. And then you, you wrote a really interesting piece called Maker Revolution mm -hmm. after Maker Fair. And, and more recently, you've written a piece because I'm with the makers and the mm -hmm. creators and the mm -hmm. mentors. So I just wanted to pick your brain. I've been so inspired by the maker movement. And I think one of the most important things to me is I see it explicitly as a movement. There are many different camps. There's the folks building a 3D printer at home. There's the people taking apart their car because they want to understand how it works. There's the people building websites and, and building apps and all those different things. But the, the union of all those sets is kind of a shared ethos, right? There is, there is this idea that people have of I can create something, I can take what I have and make it mine, whether that's customizing it to my taste or making that device do things the manufacturer didn't intend or whatever it was. And across the board, that's a really a pioneering spirit. It's, you know, I, I say this because I'm an American, but it feels very American. I think anybody who's proud of their country says, oh, that's what our spirit is. That's how we explore. It's something that actually resonated with me. I got it. I was really lucky. I got a chance to go to see the last space shuttle launch. And I was like, those are makers, right? They, these are people that make stuff. And I don't like to politicize things. I like governance, not politics. But there is a political aspect to taking control in your hands of the tools of creation, of the, the objects that define our culture and define our lives, of the technology that defines our lives, and saying, this is mine. I'm going to choose what I do with it. I'm not going to let an institution, whether that's government, corporation, whatever, tell me I can't do this with it. And so much of political discourse is about, no, that person's wrong today. And let's stop them from doing the thing that they think is right for the country. So little is about, well, what are we going to make? What are we going to be? Who are we going to be when, when our country grows up? And that is one of the things that I think has drawn me over and over and over to the maker movement is this is, it's apolitical because it appeals to everybody. You can be anywhere on the political spectrum and there's something that speaks to your uh, desire to be in a collective community of people that are collaborating together and your self-expression and individuality as shown through what you've done and contributed. And that is so exciting, that combination of no matter where you fit politically, there's something for you to resonate and say, this fits in with my beliefs. And it's purely positive. It's really inclusive. You see people of all ages at a maker fair. You see people of every background, every ability there. And it's so welcoming. I'm, you know, I'm, I haven't really actually soldered anything together in 20 years. Like, it's still in my head. Mm -hmm. But, you know, last time was probably in high school. But if you say, am I a person that does it? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's part of my identity. Yeah. Certainly, you know, I'm a lousy coder these days because I'm out of practice, but I'm, am I somebody that, does, that makes apps on the computer? Yeah, I'm, I'm that kind of person. And so it's your tribe, it's who you belong to. And I can be years out of practice, go in to a Maker Fair and say, oh, I haven't put something together in a while, but somebody's got a good Arduino kit and I want to check out what it does. And they'll show me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it'll invert. It's not uh, the apprentice and the student because it's a 10 year old showing me, mm -hmm. you know, what it is. But that kind of thing, that feels to me like in a, in a less optimistic world, in a less ideal world, somebody would be taking that and saying, well, that's our political movement. And everybody that's been involved in the maker movement so far has been very judicious and thoughtful and not exploiting it that way. But you put it up against any modern political movement, anybody anywhere on this political spectrum, you look at you know, the Tea Party or anybody else, it's the same number of people are participating in a maker fair and going out and doing something that is optimistic, that's going to provide jobs, that's going to help with security, that's going to give people you know, a, a great future that brings their families and communities together, I think that's the most exciting thing in the world. Mm -hmm. That's great. There's also, I, one of the things that's fascinating when people connect to this, they seem to not only connect themselves, but like their family. There's mm -hmm. a history there that connects, that brings things forward. In the past, I noticed you did that in, in one of your pieces. Yeah, nobody, nobody is a maker on their own. You, you know, you, you can tinker, you can figure something out, you can problem solve on your own, but it's intrinsically a community activity. And it is about, the, it's what drove most of our families here, right? It's the desire to make something, make some kind of opportunity. My 
dad is a, a highway engineer. He just retired again, actually, but he's not the kind of guy that stays retired. And you know, he built highways all across the country and, and helped work on the foundation at Disney World and all these things. And that that gets in your blood. And he's also, of course, the guy bought, bought me my first computer and led me on my path. And everybody I talk to that's ever been to a Maker Faire has the same story. You know, it's, oh, my mom was a computer programmer and she showed me how to get my first Commodore computer or you know, dad and I built model rockets or whatever it is. Uh, you know, frankly, you know, the kid down the street and I were blowing stuff up when we were kids, but that was still, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, we, we had to make the thing that we blew up. And, and that part of being part of a community is intrinsic to it. And it's the sort of thing that the conventional wisdom says doesn't happen. People cross political boundaries, class boundaries, all these other lines that, that we say, oh, well, people don't look on the other side of the street. They don't think others that are different from them could ever have a meaningful conversation. And they do it without thinking mm -hmm. in this context. Yeah, the, I, I've, I've thought somewhat in the context of children, but you know, the, there is often in, in sort of culture a certain apathy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this DIY stuff really is at the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. and that's what's so exciting. I, I think a lot of us have uh, garnered this idea from technology once we could kind of get control over that mm -hmm. and do stuff with it. We think sometimes with a certain amount of hubris that we could do almost anything, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and, and well, the, the apathy, apathy happens in the environments where people think they have no agency, they have no control. And if I'm watching media that somebody else created on a device I'm not allowed to hack in an environment where I can't choose what, 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 how to change the channel or anything, of course I'm going to be apathetic. If I made that box and I'm watching some homemade media that somebody else made themselves and I've got complete control over how I can remix it and do things with it, I'm instantly going to be you know, leaning forward instead of leaning back. And that, it just pervades the way you think of culture overall. It's how you see society. It, it, it happens in food. You know, my, my wife said that we're versed in the food world and has taught me a lot about it. And I think in simple terms, you would never eat every meal of the sort of factory food from a fast food place. Sometimes you gotta have a meal that's made by people you love and eaten with people you love. And the same has to be true for our gadgets. The same has to be true for the tools that we use. The same has to be true for the media that we make. Some of it has to be made with love, by people we love, shared with people we love. It's just, that's human nature, that's what we need. And when we don't get that, we get apathetic. And it's the same as, you know, if I, you know, when I had a dog, if you'd leave her alone at home for the whole day, you'd come back, she'd be sad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, when well, you don't have any control or interaction over what you're doing, you're sad. And we have always historically had that, you know, the first radios people had when radio was reading the broadcast, they'd built. And they built from a kit. And I remember building a crystal radio from a Radio Shack kit when I was nine years old. And I didn't like anything on AM radio, but I would listen to it because I made it. And if somebody had told me someday I'd be able to broadcast and get a thousand people on the internet to go and listen to it, to read it, I wouldn't have believed you. I would just be science fiction. Mm -hmm. And now it's taken for granted. And, you know, a generation of kids growing up taking that for granted, what are they going to do next? And say, well, I assume I can reach a million people. Now, what can I do with that power? And that's, I think that's what informs so much of the maker spirit. It's also the the people that didn't, that aren't native to that culture, that didn't grow up in that community, that don't love making, or that see it sort of as a threat or a danger, only want to emphasize the risks, you know. And that, and you should have somebody saying, you know, you'll poke your eye out. Like there's a, there's a certain amount of, of let's be safe, but we haven't even begun to tap in to what's possible. Yeah, and risk taking. Almost, it's, 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 it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like there's a whole course in it in the yeah. maker world, right? Yeah. And, and and I think there's very few places that are even engaged in that discussion anymore mm -hmm. of what is the appropriate level of risk and how do you sort of overcome uh, mm -hmm. uh, a certain fear of risks mm -hmm. and uh, a way to manage risks. Now, we're to, one of the things I think about a lot is how do you normalize risks? There's, there are things people will say, oh, kids are bound to power tools. Like, yeah, but you let them swim in a pool, don't you? Mm -hmm. Across you know? the street. Right. And, and you're not there because there's a lifeguard there. Well, and, and, and it's also, we, as people, we're bad at judging risks and understanding what are the real dangers. And there's a million examples, but the sort of, if I've got a hamburger and the meat's from 100 cows instead of one cow, my risk has gone up you know, massively, but I don't 
have any way of actually perceiving that difference when they're sitting on the grill. And so there are, there are the invisible risks, and this always happens with, with making, is it simply is revealing that the, the risk there was probably always there. And that's what makes people uncomfortable, is they're really confronting, gosh, you mean everything, you know, all our electronics can be hacked? Like everything, you know, there's never, there's never something that's actually keeping you from harming yourself, but you feel like there's uh, a buffer between you actually having to confront it. And taking that away is really useful. Uh, I always go back to the media examples because I know that world pretty well, but the first time you actually you write a book, you write a story, you write a blog post, whatever it is, you start to realize, gosh, everything I've ever read in my life was made that way too. And the person writing it was as uninformed as I am about whatever I'm writing about or, or whatever. And, and they often wrote the article as a way of learning. As a way of learning about it. Exactly. To it's it's to their like, credit, and right. it's a great way to learn. And the same is true for every tool I've ever used and every object I've ever handled, every computer I've ever you know, worked on has been, well, gosh, somebody as either knowledgeable or ignorant as I am built this too. Yeah. And and had to incur those risks, had to yeah. take those risks. There's a great, I was at MakerBot uh, on mm -hmm. Saturday. They were, they were teaching a workshop for teachers. Mm -hmm. And the two leaders of the workshop made the comment that the design software they were teaching had changed just last week. Yeah. You know, and I thought that's really the world we live in, mm -hmm. that, that even the teachers you know, can't rely on uh, uh, something that is, is really... You know, I mean, they have to look at things as constantly changing rather than stable and, and vetted and everything else. Well, it's just like it's always in and kind of learning to live in that environment is, is really a different thing. And this really challenges what authority is. Right? I, you know, I grew up in a pretty traditional Asian American household, which is the teacher is God. Right? You have absolute reverence. And I was a normal American kid, which is to say I got in trouble and got kicked out of class sometimes and, and flunked, flunked some tests. And it was, you know, uh, just... It was sacrilegious. It was an unforgivable offense. And what I realized from that perspective was there's the assumption that the teacher is authoritative about their subject. And the classes where I did the worst, like the computer class, where I, this wasn't bragging because I think that teacher would have admitted himself back in 1986, but I knew more about the computers than he did. And so, of course, I wasn't going to say this person is an authority when I'm like, I don't know much, but I know more than you. So why don't we learn together? And that's not a model that, is, that fits with traditional authority. Mm -hmm. And it requires that authority be confident and not insecure mm -hmm. enough to say, I'll learn with you, student. Mm -hmm. And that, which ends up being a great experience. People are happier, more engaged, they learn more, they learn faster, all those other you know, things go up. But that model of what it is to be a maker is radical. And people have to be ready for that change. I think kids are native to it. I mean, I, I'm fixated on this because I, I became a parent at the beginning of this year, and you know, you see uh, uh, your kid gives you this clarity about, oh man, I'm gonna teach him about stuff that I forgot, I never knew, or that I never even, that didn't exist when I was you know, his age, or all those types of things. That stuff is, if you can embrace it and say, I'm comfortable with only having my positional authority, but not having the authority of I'm putting you in your place and not pretending to be the expert about something I'm not. Yeah. There's a great book I just came across that was written in the 70s and part of a, um, a wave of constructivist education, but mm -hmm. Piaget, who, who writes you know, about childhood development, it's the only book on education is called, at least the English language translation, which is to learn is to invent. And mm. what he means is that you that the learning process is putting things together, mm -hmm. even mentally, right? Mm -hmm. Just of that that you you can't learn but from doing that process. Right. Because I think a lot of our models today are, are almost this sort of and even with media companies, it's mm -hmm. like how much do we shovel? How much can you absorb? Right. Uh, what's the retention from you know mm -hmm. that rather than than sort of really building things up and breaking them down and building them up again? Mm -hmm. You know, you see a pattern. And you think Making something's true, right? And then it turns out not to be true, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like a common sense truth, and then you find out, well, that's not actually how it works. Right? There's the, the quote, and I always forget who said it, but it's the it's not the eureka moment. It's the hmm, that's strange, right? That's <laughs> right. the moment you want right. is the, the unexpected thing. I think that's absolutely right. Is you you have to be inventing, and uh, we we breed it out of ourselves. Right. You know, when we're we go from children to adulthood, when yeah. we go to early in our career. 
It's that, you know, people, uh, you can talk to a million people that work in offices and they say, well, my boss told me I'm not here for my ideas. I'm here to do this job. Yeah. One of the things I'm proud of the maker movement is that we have taken the word invention and really broadened it. Like mm -hmm. most people won't say they're an inventor. That's mm -hmm. that's some kind of person that they're not. Yeah, that's, just as some people crazy will say hair and they they're not an artist, ago. right? Yeah. You know, and I really think the the luck uh, of this is that people can say they make things, mm -hmm. and it's a real simple way. I can make food, right? right. I can make right. an inventor uh, is on a on a pedestal and does right. this other thing, right. but a maker, I make. Right. Everybody makes. Something. And that's why when you talk about politically, this participatory sense is really mm -hmm. key. That I. I do this, and, and therefore, you well, know, and it solves things. every class of problem. If you say education is broken in America because it, kids aren't performing as well as kids in other countries, there's a path through empowering kids to make that improves that. If you say jobs are broken because so many millions of people are out of work and the industries that they could go to don't exist anymore, the only solution is making something new, mm -hmm. and. You know, across the board, it's it's jobs, it's education, it's defense, it's healthcare. every single area. Healthcare, it, it, it you can you can only make your way out of it because we've tried everything else. Right, but there is this sort of backdrop in the media a lot of times that we say, oh, what can government do to mm -hmm. produce more jobs? You know, yeah. and 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 we're pretty unhappy generally with what government has done in the past to to answer these problems. And, and the like, marketing sucks. Right. right yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But. Uh, um, I, I wish there were ways of getting that well, into that expression turned around. What can we do? We, what can we do? There's also one of the interesting things about the government part of it is we we don't consider the work that comes from government to be making. You know, one of my closest friends is a cancer researcher at the National Institutes of Health. He works on cancer in children. I, I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult his job yeah. is. And. You know, he does research, he, he's, he can conducts clinical trials to, to test drugs, he's doing all these different parts of when some of the cancers that affect kids are cured, it's going to be because of his work, right? He's, he'll have contributed. And that's profound making. And it's the kind of thing that does not, and for good reason, have a market-driven private industry business model, right? But it's an important contribution, and it will be the platform on which you know, someday when you go down the corner drugstore and you get a cure cancer pill, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be built because of that. And, but it's a long, slow make. Yeah. And it can only be appreciated if you've ever done yourself something that took a long time to yeah. build, that was gradual, that took you a decade of practice before yeah. you became an overnight success. That's a really uh, good point. I love the, the long, slow make. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, because we think of things that we respect from the past, like cathedrals, mm. you know, 300 years or, or more. The building. Washington Monument, it right. sat there for 50 years w as a stub, Right. you know? It, it was the base, and then they like, well, we ran out of money, and then there was a civil war, and then, you know, we're in a different part of the quarry, and the stone's not going to match, and all these different issues, but there's this little, you know, stump of a, of, a, of a monument for 50 years, and during that time period, that's an entire lifespan, yeah. and then some. Yeah. So, so there are people who were you know, who lived and died in the interim when the Washington Monument right. was just this weird looking flat top thing uh, in the middle of the capital city. But when we think about transforming our world or remaking it, mm -hmm. it is these sort of multi generational mm -hmm. solutions that we really yeah. need to think about, not just something that can be done in a, in a single budget year right. or something that can be done in a single term. This is things and that. And everything we look at is inspiring, right. is something that has that long slow make that has that period where it looks like it's stumped, it looks like it's stopped, it looks like it's been finished or, yeah. or never will be finished. Uh, you know, here in New York City, I'm a huge transit geek and we've been working steadily on having a Second Avenue subway for about 70 years. And we're going to get two or three stops done in the next couple of years. But on the flip side, my son will always have known there's a Second Avenue subway. He won't remember a time without it. So to me, it's, I mean, it was a punchline when I moved to this city 15 years ago. I thought, well, yeah, we'll get that when we get a Second Avenue subway. And for him, it will just be always yeah. there. And, and I think it's so, so easy to just ignore right. everything we look at as a symbol. We look at as representing what we can achieve. Even and talking about having been at the last space shuttle launch, the building that they kept the space shuttles in was built for the Apollo program. 
So you're going back 50 years, you know, that these buildings were built and repurposed and modified by people that said, well, I can work with this. These are the raw materials that work. They have excess capacity because the shuttle's so much smaller than a Saturn rocket. Mm -hmm. And that's classic making, right? That is just that we're going to reuse what we have and put it to use, and it'll last us 50 years instead of 10. It'll work us through three projects and all these different missions. And which sort of ties back to the importance of that and what I'm most satisfied about is seeing making connect to kids. You know, mm -hmm. Because if we, we can't do this in this generation, we've mm -hmm. really got... You know, to get them to do things, and they're going to do things, and pass that on as well. Well, and we haven't proven we're any good at it. Right. I mean, one of the things adults forget really often is we don't have any credibility. If we say, "Well, kids, you should listen to us because we know how to fix the jobs problem. We know how to fix the environmental problems." We know. No, we don't. Like we de demonstrated, we don't know how. Right. Like well, our our credibility should be nothing. Yeah. And so, like the the starting point should be all we can give you. Is, is some lightly used materials <laughs> that hopefully you can repurpose into coming right. up with a real solution. Right. Well, again, I, thank you for, for, for talking here. I just th think you have this really great insight into what you sometimes call the political or social context of making. And, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes that scares me to talk on that level. Well, I... But, I, you know, I, it, but I, on the other hand, I'm, one of the words that I'm really happy, and it comes out not from me saying it, but other people say, you know, this making is kind of subversive. Yeah. You know, they'll say yeah. that. And, and I'd rather them draw that conclusion than just mm -hmm. repeat something that we say. But it makes... I, I think it is. It's subversive in a good way in the sense that America is a radical country and a radical nation at its core. Right, there, there, there is, a, is a place joined by an idea at its highest ideals, and fundamental to that is creation and making. And I, I, I thank you because you have led it without ego and with humility that lets people take what they want from the movement and, and literally make it their own. And that's the kind of thing that, that lets people actually be constructive with one another and cross the boundaries where if you go preconceived notions of, well, I have to affiliate with these other kinds of people, or achieve this goal, they would never think of it. Yeah. One of the, it kind of relates to this, one of the things that I see even having done last year's fair through this mm -hmm. year's, is the people that met last year and used each other as resources, mm -hmm. right? Of mm -hmm. Some homeschooling mother saying, my son is really, you know, not happy in school, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, uh, uh, but he needs connection into a community like this, goes and talks to the hackerspace, mm -hmm. says, is it, would any of you come and meet with us regularly? Mm -hmm. And last Saturday, he was, a, he was an intern at MakerBot. That's that same kid, you know, within one year, you know, yeah. and so... And it changes your life. Right, right. I mean, small choices of, you know, my dad said they should play with this spreadsheet app when I was eight years old, changed the course of my life. And, you know, it was, wasn't, a, he wasn't making a profound right. decision on his part. He, he just revealed to me that I could make something. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.